Tonight's episode of ABCA At Home Perspectives is made possible by Pocket Radar. Pocket Radar's smart coach app system with its unique ability to automatically capture videos with embedded velocities allows coaches to stay connected and work remotely with current players and new recruits. Their Bring Your Training Home initiative will provide education and resources, including webinars and a limited time discount to help players remotely train, develop, and be seen at home with video analysis tools. Check out their 2020 Expo Theater presentation located in the ABCA Video Library. having sight without vision. When people start celebrating small things that occur on the field, the next thing you know, you get this small amount of energy and then it just builds up. And the next thing you know, the environment, the energy and the environment that is created is very positive and it's contagious and very enthusiastic. And really as a coach, that's what you want. Welcome to the American Baseball Coaches Association's At Home Perspectives. The ABCA will be organizing and streaming live virtual coaching clinics featuring a different panel discussing a different element of the game every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. These clinics will be archived and available to watch on demand within the My ABCA mobile app and the Coaching Resource Library section of our website. Interact with us on Twitter. Send your questions to at ABCA1945 with the hashtag ABCA at home. Don't forget to include your name and rep your program. Since 1945, the ABCA has been bringing great coaching minds together to educate, mentor, guide, and support the greatest game in the world. Tonight is no exception, so grab your notebook and prepare to lock in for the next 90 minutes. We have a great conversation in store for you. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jim Richardson, and I will serve as your ABCA at home host. Tonight's conversation is centered around one of the most overlooked and underappreciated aspects of hitting the approach. We've lined up some of the best in the country to walk us through their philosophy language, how they strategize, and most importantly, how they go about training approach that keeps their at-bats offensive. With that, I'd like to have our panel go around the horn and introduce themselves. Hey, Aaron, thanks for having me, man. Darren Everson, hitting coordinator for the uh, Colorado Rockies, and uh, in my eighth year with the Rockies, uh, multiple years before that, and uh, been a college coach, youth coach, but uh, thrilled to be a Rocky and, and uh like I said, third year with them and uh, talking a lot of approach. JR, Rudy Garbalosa, thank you for having me. What an honor to be here with these outstanding coaches. Uh, honored to be a part of this um, head coach at Lynn University. Uh, 20, just I think we're 20th, uh, 20th season, I believe. Uh, been very fortunate to have coached at many different levels before uh, when I was uh, young and probably had more hair. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking approach, uh, the importance of that here tonight. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Coach. JR, Chris Hart, NC State, uh, Associate Head Coach at NC State. Uh, extremely fortunate to, to get here 16 years ago. Been here for a long time, kind of worked my way up from the volunteer position to where I'm at today. And uh, I really appreciate you having me on here tonight. Really look forward to, to learning from you guys as well. And uh, thanks a lot. 
Link Jarrett, head coach at Notre Dame. Um, I look back, 1999, I began my journey with the ABCA. Dave Barnett at Flagler College gave me my first job. It was a blessing, uh, the things I learned from Dave. And, you know, to, to get to this moment and the involvement with the ABCA and all the people that I've met and the experiences I've had, all the conventions, um, you know, and we think of this in an, an instructional setting. I also look at the ABCA and all that they do to help our sport at the college level, try to continue to move forward and evolve. And, you know, it's an honor to be a part of this panel. And, and it's really been a privilege to be associated with the organization for 20 years now. Thank you, Coach. Did Coach Barnett ever share any of those King and, the, uh, King and his court stories with you or no? They're the best stories I've ever oh heard. Oh, my gosh. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. I, every time we get together, I try to dig in on it. Phenomenal stuff. No doubt, man. No doubt. I got to see them oh, years ago. And it, uh, I don't know if Coach Barnett was playing shortstop back in the day. For, for any of you guys who don't know what we're talking about, just go on YouTube and Google the King and his court. It was one of the most ridiculous, oh gosh, I can't even put it into words he what this guy did. and center field and everything. They yeah. had a first baseman, a pitcher, a catcher, and him. Yep. And this guy just threw like 80 miles an hour fast pitch softball from 40 feet away and just destroyed every <laughs> team they played. It was like the Harlem Globetrotters of fast pitch men's softball. Exactly but, what it was. Oh, well. Coach Prettyman, I apologize. Pass no, it over no to you. No problem, JR. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Um, really enjoyed having you guys come through UW this fall or no yeah, doubt. September last uh, 2019. So um, really excited to be on here and, and talk with these guys and, and talk hitting, my favorite thing to do. So i um, been at UW now for, I guess we can only say like a year and a third since this <laughs> season didn't really count too much. So i um, excited for next year. But uh, yeah, so I'm ready to get going. Awesome. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to jump right in. Um, first question, it's kind of uh, it's kind of tradition. I mean, uh, as baseball coaches, you hear it all the time. We, we're great thieves. We like to steal other people's information and kind of repackage it and rebundle it, change some words around it and kind of make it our own. I mean, that's part of the reason why we have that convention every year, so we can get great minds together and share some information. Uh, but um, I don't want to look at it as stealing, more so, more so an influence. And when it comes down to to approach and hitting, you know, I, I'm very curious to find out who your influences are. Who's, who's the guy when uh, you're not getting through to your players that you're calling on the phone and saying, "Hey, man, I I need some help with this." Um, yeah, D. Where's this all come from for you? <laughs> yeah, there's so many. And like you said, we, we steal from the from all kinds of different people and, and take some, you know, the filters that we create that we've had our whole lives and, and trying to how we learn and that type of thing. Uh, we re, we kind of relate to the people that we, you know, they give the information that really responds to us, like it really sits in there. And uh, as a player, definitely for me, uh, when I played junior college out at Butte College and, and Daryl Stevens and Jim Lauer back in the day, uh, were tremendous, especially coming from the Midwest, going out there to do my thing. And um, they were huge. But uh, then in pro ball, Pat Wrestler, who's still out there doing his thing and got to see him two years ago, <clears throat> hitting coordinator there and, and big league coach over year after year, John Maley with different things that he's showed me when I was with the Marlins, uh, for sure. And then there's so many recently, uh, so many uh, just how the game has changed in the last uh, three to five years, as we all are, all know and all will talk about um, just all the different influences that are out there and, and trying to weave through the stuff that actually makes sense and actually uh, uh, works for players. And, and, and it's what's unique about it is it ties into a lot of stuff that we talked about way back in the day, too. So the old becomes new and vice versa. So. Um, just a ton of people and, and obviously very uh, fortunate to be with uh, have my shoulders next to, next to a lot of great coaches that are that are out there that I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting but uh, appreciate them for sure no doubt no doubt thank you coach garbs what about uh, what about you where's this where's this approach to hitting come from uh, well I was very fortunate uh, to grow up in uh, in, a, in, a, in Southern California in an era where there was a, a hotbed of great coaching minds and um, really started with my uh, high school coach, Bob Anderson, who is the one who actually got me into coaching. Um, and he's always been a big influence of me. 
Uh, and then uh, I was fortunate to, to play with two coaches at Long Beach State with uh, John Gonzalez and Dave Snow, and both of them two different approaches and, and really uh, expanded my horizons. And then after that, it was just, um, you know, when I started coaching, I just reached out to all those great coaches, uh, Mike Gillespie, the Andy Lopez's, the Aguerritos, and just communicated with them and allowed, and they allowed me to go out and watch practices and learn from them at practice. And that was kind of like my internship. Uh, in coaching and then obviously Jody Robinson who gave me my first uh, collegiate job man I'm really indebted to him who was really a, a really a mastermind of uh, approach and dealing with players which I really learned a lot about from him so very grateful to for these opportunities and to be able to take that knowledge and what I've learned from them and share it with other student athletes who actually teach us a lot more as well you know I think we learn a lot from our players um you know, you get a great base and then you grow and you learn from your players. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you, coach. Coach Hart, what about, uh, what about you? Yeah. Um, you know, I was very fortunate to, to get a play at Florida state and get a play for Mike Martin, who obviously has been pretty successful in our game. You think? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to play there and, and learn, you know, so much about this game, not just about the approach or, or offense or, you know, everything. Like, I mean, I felt like I was getting a master's degree for the first, you know, first semester of my freshman year. I didn't, I thought I knew what a baseball was until I got there and then I thought I was an idiot. Um, so obviously that was very fortunate. You know, I'll touch on, you know, what Rudy just said, you know, when, when I got to Florida State, I thought, or excuse me, when I got to NC State, you know, I was 24 years old. You think you know what you're doing. You think you have a clue. Um, but you learn so much just being around the players and watching the game and, and getting into the coach's shoes. You know, it's different than being a player. You see more, you watch more, you're, you're paying attention more. And, you know, a guy that I had early in, in my career here, Aaron Bates, you know, he was so far advanced mentally that I had never been around. You know, I had never been around someone that had that much, you know, mental awareness of what was going on at the plate. And, and, you know, I learned so much from him as, him being a player and me being a 24 year old, you know, coach. Um, and then really honestly, the guy I lean on now is, is two screens under me link. You know, we talk a lot and, you know, we pick each other's brains a lot and, and, but he's always the guy that I would call, you know, now about really anything to do with baseball. I mean, we talk a lot and um, he's definitely the guy that I would lean on, you know, to, to go over anything offensive for sure. That's awesome. Thank you. Now you guys, you overlapped at Florida state for, for three years. Was it? I, years? I coached there one year while Chris was playing. Okay. And you know, I can piggyback right into my portion of this. Um, again, I, I played at Florida state and came back to coach one year and I got to coach Chris. He was a phenomenal player. Very, very smart. Um, and when I start thinking back, when you ask, how did the approach stuff come about? I even remember one at bat where I think he told me in the middle of the game, he's like, this guy's going to throw me a breaking ball and hit it over the scoreboard. And like, you remember that Chris? <laughs> yeah. And he hit about a 52 hopper through the six hole. And I was standing over there. I was coaching first base. I'm yelling, get up ball, get up, get up. And it was just, we were laughing about it to this day, but even mm. moments like that where, he was telling me in a roundabout way, I'm sitting on this breaking ball and I'm going to hit it out. And he didn't hit it out. He got a hit. But as a young coach, I started to think about the great players break this thing down into small facets of an at-bat. It's not really an at-bat. It's really a pitch of an at-bat. And uh, being around Coach Martin as a player and a coach, obviously a tremendous foundation for coaching. Um, my current staff, Rich Wallace, Chuck Rostano, Scott Wingo, and I lean on those guys. If I see something that doesn't look right with any facet of our program, I, I'm, I'm going to lean on those guys. They see our players every day, and, and they grind as hard as anybody I've been around to, to help our program. But I think if you really want to evaluate how you got where you are and why things have worked, it's the ability to be open-minded and pull pieces from um, head coaches that I worked under, other assistant coaches that I worked beside. 
as a player, uh, there was going to be a coach, uh, Greg Rose, Clint Hurdle, um, Rudy Jaramillo, phenomenal baseball minds. I recognize that I probably wasn't a major league player. So let me grab bits and pieces um, from the people I got to associate with. And then to be honest, like I said about Chris, watching what the great players did well was a huge part of my development as a coach and trying to model what I did after the greatest players I saw. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you, coach. RP, what about you? I mean, you played at a bunch of different places, started out Cerritos, Cal State Fullerton, College World Series, uh, made it up to AAA, you played for a bunch of guys. Where mm -hmm. does uh, where does this kind of focus on approach come from uh, with you? Yeah, I, I, you know, I stepped on campus after a year at Cerritos at Cal State Fullerton and had George Horton, uh, Rick Vanderhoek, Dave Serrano, and Chad Baum on staff, all who are head coaches now. Yeah. Um, and one of the crazy things about my experience with those guys in those first couple of years, because added to that staff in my three years there was Jason Gill um, and then Ted Silva, who's with Gilly over at USC now. So uh, talk about an all-star staff that I was able to be around on a daily basis and not even knowing how lucky I was at that time to step into that situation. But one of the things that we just stressed a lot and this kind of uh, formed, you know, my kind of mentality and how I went into pro ball was you know, th while they could talk mechanics and break down the swing, the, the option that they chose was to be more about mentality and approach and, you know, what we're trying to do with the baseball and, you know, how we're trying to hit it and where we're trying to hit it um, and how we need to approach each pitcher individually. So having those guys and the opportunity to reach out and talk to those guys when needed um, is such an advantage, but also just having teammates that I played with there or in pro ball that I can reach out to, which is something that I do all the time. Um, Bobby Andrews, Neil Walton, two guys that, you know, I'll break hitting down with on a regular basis weekly. Uh, but then something that I do that I think has been really helpful for me is I reach out to former players, guys that I coached and just ask them, and some of them aren't even playing anymore. So, you know, maybe I, I didn't coach them well enough, but, uh, you know, just asking them, Hey man, what resonated with you? What really stuck out as far as when we're, when I'm describing something or trying to teach you something, what is, what's hitting home? Um, and just understanding that every guy is going to be a little different and, you know, how I approach one guy is going to be different than another guy and having those those young men as resources to kind of get better. Um, and then I, I love um, diving into some of the new guys. Doug Latta is, is someone that I talk to regularly and he is, uh, you know, I love his point of view on just how keeping the swing athletic and, and having an athletic setup and trying not to get away from that, um, from that balance is a big deal. So I have a bunch of people that I get to pick from and get to kind of pick their brain and different guys have different strengths and it's a it's a great group no doubt no doubt well i definitely appreciate you guys sharing and the uh just to get the conversation kind of going we're going to go to uh this little video jeopardy type question deal thing and um i'm really curious to find out your uh, your thoughts on this um d what do you think here assuming a competitive swing and competitive means he's on your ball club, but assuming a competitive swing, what's more important, mechanics or, or approach? I tell you what, I, I would take a guy that has an approach and understanding of, of what he's good at, uh, where his, uh, have control over his emotions and his ability to actually turn the page and talk about book readers all the time and not in terms of actually reading a book, but being able to turn the page and mentally get to the next pitch. I would, that, the mechanics guys, I've, we've had plenty of guys in a lot of different levels in pro ball and uh, when I was college as well that had pretty swings, but their approach did not help their timing. Their timing was not out in front, and they're, and so what happens is they're constantly battling their, how they are moving. Even though their swing is pretty, it does really well in a flip. It does really well in a tee, but the ability to go and actually have an approach that is going to help you hunt good pitches uh, – an understanding of what you are looking for, hunting for, and being intentional. Like, hey, we're, I'm trying to do this, or if the game tells me I have something, to, I, I need to get something done here. Actually, letting the game do that and making sure that I get the job done for the team. We call this team at bat. So, 
for me, the approach guy is someone that is generally very good. Also, our best approach guys almost across the board and then to the highest levels, uh, those are the guys that are really the best self-evaluators. They can actually, they can, they can figure out what they've done wrong. They can take some, uh, some understanding of, of uh, what they've done right too. And, but also be able to go, okay, I did this well. Last time I didn't do this well against that guy. I'm going to change my approach and I'm going to get him this way. So uh, those type of guys that are honest with each other and good, are honest with themselves generally get to be that guy. The guy that has a lot of pretty swings uh, generally wants to make it a mechanical issue on why he's struggling. A lot of, a lot of times it goes to their approach. No doubt. No doubt. Now, Garbs, have you had a kid who maybe, maybe wasn't as talented as some of these blue chip four hole, three hole hitter guys, but for <laughs> some reason he was just a guy who always was on base, always grinding out at bats, swinging at the right pitches. Uh, have you had those guys before? Do they have success in your program? We've had, we've been uh, very fortunate to have a lot of guys, or I say a lot, but a bunch of guys that have uh, had success, been very successful because of their approach and not really because they've had great swings. Uh, um, you know, most of these guys, and Darren made a great point, is these guys are more self-aware than the other guys. And they really know what makes them, or what pitches they really hit well, where do I hit the ball well, and how do I put myself in a position so that I get more pitches like that in an at-bat? You know, if you got a guy who's who hits the ball inside well, well, he's going to find a way to move around in the box or change his timing so that most pitches are in that inside timing or outer half or, you know, uh, a guy who throws a lot of breaking balls and he chases, he's going to figure out how am I going to put myself in a position so I don't chase that breaking ball and I can get that other pitch from the approach. Um, and those are things I think that are – invaluable compared to the swing you can have the best swing in the world but if you can't apply the swing you know and that's the that is the the beauty of this game is the application and the actual physical part of it the mechanical part man it's wonderful and i i think those guys are invaluable and they're infectious with the other guys much like link was talking about chris man what a great story you know th that's how guys help your team is by sharing things like that with each other because as coaches, we can only guide and so forth. When it comes from each other, that's way more powerful than when it comes from us as coaches, I've found. No doubt. Now, Coach Hart, have you always, uh, as a player, Link was sharing a story with us earlier where, you know, he, he was saying, hey, you're sitting on this breaking ball. If he gets to you this breaking ball, you're taking him deep. And um, has that always been your approach? When did you kind of, as a player, when did you start locking into him? Like, man, I need to start sitting on some pitches and being ready to attack when I get it. No, I, I, honestly, you know, my approach was pretty bad, to be honest with you, throughout college. I mean, you know, going through college, I look back now, I'm like, I'm an idiot. Like, But, you know, I was pretty much always just sitting dead fastball, fastball spit was what I call it now. And what are we doing our program, which is basically you're sitting fastball and taking breaking balls. I didn't call it that then, but that's what I was doing. And the problem I had was I just looked middle in every pitch. And, you know, <laughs> when the high level guys in our league, you know, can sit there and just go, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to dot up fastball away over and over and over and over. Well, Link's story was late in my senior year. And, you know, I started off the season really well and was hitting probably 400 and they all of a sudden in our league, they would just go, all right, here's the first pitch break ball, strike one. Here's the second pitch break ball, strike two. And, you know, after a month of that, you go, Man, I got to change something like I got to I got to figure out a different way to attack this guy or I'm always going to be in 0 2 1 2 counts and it's it gets frustrating and you know I think that's where really my approach now started is is me as a player and you kind of say you know my approach worked when you're facing an average guy that didn't have command and was going to miss you know over the middle of the plate or miss middle in and you know then it worked but if he did have command or if he did have control of the breaking ball, I, I was going to be in trouble. So I, I, you know, I realized too late for me, you know, to that, you know, I had to have different forms, different ways to attack guys. I had to be able to hit a fastball away. I had to be able to hit a breaking ball and look for a breaking ball. And, you know, so that story link was telling was, you know, later in my senior year. And I, I had basically had it and said, 
you know, I was on the on deck circle and I told him, you know what, I know this guy's going to do it again. And I'm just going to look forward and I'm going to, I'm going to kill this thing. And I killed a, I killed a bunch of worms in the infield. But, That's right. Well, to give you some props though, I mean, you did turn it on in the postseason your senior year. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you hit close to 400 through regionals and sectionals and, or super sectionals. Um, am I, am I right? Were you doing, were you just saying, yeah, did you figure it out or what? <laughs> yeah. I, like I said, I think that's when I really started to mind to say, I have to be able to do these things or, you know, guys, once we face good pitchers, like they can expose it. And, uh, you know, so I was fortunate and got a few lucky knocks and regionals, but, uh, <laughs> that's really where it all started. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Now, Coach Jarrett, would, but uh, after you left UNCG, we had a Barnstormers event that, that was hosted out there at Greensboro, and I saw the pitching machines, and I saw the, the platforms you had the pitching machines on. And um, when I was putting together this, uh, this idea for this, for this conversation about approach, I'm like, anybody who goes to that length to create visually those angles for his hitters is a guy that I want to talk about. Um, and I want to talk to us and learn from. Um, does that go into your approach, replicating stuff with machines? Is that, uh, yeah, I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself with the training, but. Um, no, it's yeah. it's good. I, I felt like poo holes, that video, that's what I felt like when I hit. I told the guys earlier, they, they're throwing five <laughs> different balls. I couldn't, I couldn't hit it. Um, but yeah, you know, what I learned is um, you can work on your swing as you also fine tune your approach and talking about approach is great, but how you actually train to simulate in game use is where the rubber meets the road for me. Um, how often we work on sitting on a breaking ball on that machine that that machine is just simply giving you a game like trajectory. Mm -hmm. That's all. I mean, it's an average trajectory, but it makes sense. Um, there's a far different feel with your approach. If you're adjusting to an off speed pitch, that's an approach. than if you're sitting on an off speed pitch, that, that is an approach. So how you work on it um, is really what you saw in the cage. And, you know, we have the same thing at Notre Dame. Fortunately, we have mounds in our indoor, so I can sit the machine and it's essentially the same height as what you saw in Greensboro's cage. Okay. And I think that's very, very important. So I don't want to discount the swing, but when we talk about a mechanically sound swing, then there's no doubt in my mind a what I call a, a mental and physical strategy for competitive in-game success. That becomes far more important than all the mechanical stuff in competition. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you, coach. Now, RP, this one may throw you, nah, it's not really going to throw you for a loop or anything, yeah, like that. <laughs> but I'm curious to find out uh, what's, do you have like a swing percentage that, uh, that your guys are attacking pitches like in a normal nine min, nine inning game, let's say you're seeing 140 to 150 pitches. What percentage of those are your guys swinging at? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the percentage, uh, but I hope it's a lot of fastballs. Um, and I hope it's a lot of fastballs that are over the plate. You know, I, I think that one thing that we, uh, we try to train and we try to talk about is if you can get a guy to consistently, um, swing at strikes and make good contact, it's going to be a pretty good hitter. Uh, it's kind of, it sounds super simple, but basically if you get guys that aren't swinging at balls, uh, and then when they do swing, they're swinging at strikes and they make good contact, you're going to have a pretty good hitting team. Uh, you know, it's a really simplified version. But, you know, for that, I think the biggest thing that we can teach our guys on approach versus mechanics is just that there is absolutely a time and a place for mechanics when it is important. There's a time where you can focus on that. Um, and there's a time where you have to work on stuff. But the game is not that time when you're in the game that can't be your focus. It can't be what your main, your, your attention is drawn to. Um, you know, that stuff comes in your early work. That stuff comes in your, your pregame prep work where you're trying to get prepared. The, the approach has to be the main focus in the game, as I think everybody said. And, um, 
you know, I think a tricky thing to do with hitters is get them to not just be able to self-correct a mechanical issue, but because it's, it's very quick for guys to say, Oh, I flew open on that. Well, yeah, you flew open, but is that a, is that a physical mistake or did you make that mistake because you had a bad approach? So being able to self-correct an approach or a bad approach or a bad thought is, is something that's, um, you know, important as opposed to just saying, you know, maybe it, taking everything as a mechanical defect in a swing, teach them how to understand when they aren't thinking right. I, I think that's part of it as well. No doubt. See, maybe, uh, maybe I was putting words in your mouth, but I thought I remember up at the barnstormers at your place, RP, I thought I remember you saying something to the effect of coaching or training, you know, the decision. And I mean, a decision happens on every single pitch. Mm -hmm. And if you're just focused on the mechanics of something, it seems like you're missing 40, 40% of the, the offensive game. Um, yeah. And I thought I remember you saying something to, to that extent, but, uh, I saw so many hitting presentations. Yeah. I don't remember an exact statistic, but, um, I can definitely tell you, we try to put our guys in competitive atmospheres and atmospheres where they're going to fail and, uh, and make it hard. Um, you know, so that's part of it. And then teaching them how to handle it. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, JR, before you go to the next thing, just to go off of what RP was talking about, we talk a lot about the swing prep versus actually hitting success, right? Are you creating yeah. hitters or are you creating swingers? And uh, separating those two are huge because there's that time, right? I think RP said it, right? It's a, there's a time to get into your mechanics, to learn different things, to learn how to change and adjust, to chase some feels the right, correct, you know, the right way. And to have that happen and be able to do that and have a go-to, have some tools in, in their toolbox mentally is, is a huge, huge thing. If they're, wait, if they're worried about their mechanics, trying to get a, get a guy over and get a base hit when it really, really matters, if they're, if they're in a lot of trouble. So uh, that's well said there by RP. Nice, nice. Okay. Now, now this next part, gentlemen, I'm not asking you to, uh, to give your opponents any uh, advantages, but uh, I'm definitely curious to find out, as I'm sure our audience is, how, how you define some of the things you define within your approach. Um, like, is there an approach? Is it a plan? What are you, what are some of your terms? What, how do you define pitches? Are you looking at shapes or types? Um, basically, you know, could you give us a, a basic overview of what your program does, what you call some things? And um, yeah, hopefully uh, our coaches can glean something from that. Um, you know, uh, Garbs, why don't we go over to you first? What do you, uh, what do you got? Any terms or anything you want to share? Um, we'll start with plan versus approach. Um, uh, for example, a plan for us is the pitcher. What are we going to do against the pitcher in general? So that's kind of like big picture stuff. All right. What do we got here? All right. We got a right-handed guy. He works the outer half does not go in. Uh, and he likes to bounce the breaking ball for a strike for, you know, two strikes for the chase. So mm -hmm. that's the, like our plan overall kind of deal approach is more individual, you know? All right. So if we got a guy who, who may chase a lot of breaking balls, all right, we're going to have a, a different approach with him. Like he may have to move up in the box and get way up there to make that pitch higher. He might have to get lower in his stance uh, so he can see that pitch higher and not chase or get taller. So he's going to have to make some adjustment in his approach based upon his strength and his weakness so that he can put himself in the best position to hit. And that requires, A, for him to know what he's good at, and two, I, which a bunch of guys have said this already, is decision-making or execution. Because knowing and saying, hey, look, you know what? I'm not going to chase that breaking ball in the dirt. Great. All right. Hey, great. Genius. For two, you know, 200 years, baseball's been saying that. Great. So – how do we get our guys to not chase that breaking ball in the dirt or chase the high fastball? That is the essence of this whole thing. And that's where approach, just like swing. Hey, how do we get this guy's elbow down? It's the same as how do we get this guy to take that high fastball? Yep. Same concept, you know, and that's the, the pudding, you know, no doubt, no doubt. Now coach Hart, do you have anything specific like box positioning, even like, uh, you know, getting up on the plate, shorting the distance or right on right. You got the, a nasty slider three quarter arm that you're facing. Are you getting up and crowding the plate to limit the, that guy's abilities, angles to hit the plate, anything, anything yeah, and everything. We were, <clears throat> you know, we basically have three different lanes for our plates. So we have sit away, we have red line to red line. 
which is basically three inches from the outside corner, three inches from the inside corner, two red lines right down the heart of the plate. Then we have sit in. Those are our three lanes. So sitting away, red line to red line, or sit in. Um, with, within those lanes, you can obviously fastball spit. You could fastball adjust. You could sit soft. You can do all that stuff. And we work on all those things with everything we do, really. Um, as far as do we move? It's totally up to our guys as far as what basically all the approaches, the lanes, the pitches, what they're doing. We practice them all day, every day. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily tell our guys, hey, you're going to do this against this guy. You're the one that's going to get in that box. You're the one that has to be able to feel like it's my decision. I'm going to go in there and sit soft or I'm going to go in there and sit away or I'm going to sit in. If this guy's doing one thing to Will Wilson, he might not be doing the same thing to JT Jarrett. It's not the same for every guy. So uh, do our guys do move? Yeah, they shift a little bit. You know, if they are sitting away, they're going to shift a little bit closer to the plate. If they're sitting in, they're going to shift a little bit further away from the plate. Um, it just depends on, like I said, the pitcher. And um, those are the things that we constantly work on all the day, all, every day, all day. You know, whether it's off a tee or front toss or BP or scrimmage, they're constantly working on all those different weapons that they can take into a game and use whenever they feel it's the right time to use that approach. If it's, you know, we've, We've all faced, like I told the story about myself, I wish I had these tools when I played. Yeah. And when guys had, to, had fastball come in to sit there and throw, you know, fastball away, away. When I played, I was quickly 0-2. If that guy could do that. Now I feel like what I want to do is teach our guys that, hey, if that guy does have that command, then as a group, when you get done with your at-bat and you're coming in the dugout and you're talking to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy, pretty quickly – you know, we have to realize as a group that, hey, this guy is dotting up fastball away, 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 away. And we have to, they have to communicate to each other that, hey, we have to sit away. Like, if we don't, it's going to be a quick night. He's going to, he's going to locate it there all night. And, and you can go ahead and look fastball middle, middle in if you want, but he's not going to give it to you. So, again, we don't necessarily tell them what to do. Um, we practice all those different weapons to, implement on their own throughout a game and then it's up to them you know to to implement which one they feel like is the best strategy for them to attack that pitcher makes sense makes sense coach Jarrett same question any uh, anything you want to share in regards to your uh, your programs definitions philosophies on approach sure um, that I thought that was great Chris and we mirror a lot of the same concepts in what we do um, can you pull up my first slide, JR? Is that possible? The building complete hitters? Of course. It'll take me eh, about a second or two. There you go. That, that's good. If I took over a new program, and this is the sixth time as a coach I've walked into a new place, and you have a team looking at you. At, they're ready to hear what your style is. And I guess the swing column – is individualized for me. I think every player has certain facets to their style with the swing. And we could sit here and talk about that column for two hours if we wanted to. The hitting side, um, and again, this is exactly what I show our team, hitting to me, the right-hand column, when you add it up, equals – a quality approach. It's your ability to track. It's having hitting zone boundaries, which the way we measure it out, it's 11 inches. And that 11 inches is not a middle third. It's bigger than a third of the plate, but that 11 inches in the middle, um, that's important. And, and like Chris said, when you sit away, our 11 inch boundaries, it really now in my mind, I'm sliding that 11 inch boundary so it expands maybe a little bit beyond the outside black. If I'm sitting in, in my mind, that 11-inch boundary is something I just pull towards me a little bit. The strike zone is essentially, so two-strike approach, we talk about you have to handle 22 inches. So you're going from probably a ball off the plate, at least a ball off the plate, um, to maybe a little bit in. I, I don't have a, a guy 
takes a ball that's on the white line in that's 95 miles an hour, if that's a strike, then, you know, so be it. I, I don't expect them to handle 30 inches, but I think 22 gives you enough two-strike boundary, always looking away. Um, the fastball rhythm. When the stuff is really, really good, sometimes your ability to time and sense the fastball velocity gives you your best chance to lay off it if it doesn't feel like it's that fastball feel. And you might not see spin. You might not see it out of the hand, but we talk a lot about fastball rhythm. A mid-pitch adjustment, we work on that a lot. Obviously, with two strikes, we work from fastball and then adjust off speed. If you're making mid-pitch adjustments less than two strikes in our program, you need to be sure that the quality of contact is – as it should be, like it should be really hit well. Post pitch adjustment, like what did that look like? What did I feel? What is my plan for the next pitch? And then just simply the focus of staying in the moment in the game and not becoming distracted. I see the greatest of the great hitters not give away at bats and pitches and therefore they, they don't seem to have prolonged um, slumps or whatever you want to call it because there's such an in the moment focus and, um, you know, those are the things that really we get to equating a, a quality approach in our program. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Coach. RP, what are you guys doing up in, uh, up in Washington? Do you have any uh, sort of philosophies, anything um, team-wise, program-wise that you uh, want to share for the better of the ball club out here? Yeah, you know, I think everybody's going to have their language, and it's really important, obviously, to have your language within your team um, and terminology and stuff. And I think the one thing, as you're building language within your program that is important is not necessarily the word itself, but kind of how it's phrased. And uh, I'll, I'll give two examples of, of kind of things that I've tried to rephrase to make them better for our guys, which is, you know, instead of what, what a lot of people would do as, as they're trying to start their rounds out and give the, the good middle away feel, you know, and I had, uh, I've had people say, Hey, this is going to be an oppo round. And all of a sudden, you have guys that can't get out of the cage and they're flaring balls down the, the opposite field line. And I don't think there's anybody in the country that's really looking for that um, when we're trying to get prepared for a game or a BP setting or a drill setting. So um, one thing that I like to use is, is beat the oppo middle infielder, uh, which for me, just, just phrasing it like that. I feel like if you can, if you can have the approaches, I'm not trying to hit a, a ground ball. I'm not trying to fist one as a left-handed hitter over to that shortstop. I'm literally trying to knock him down and, and try to, you know, I, I'll say sometimes, hey, make that guy dance. You know, I want to see that guy dance. I want, to, I want to see him move his feet and make it kind of that mentality. I think that that can change the whole approach of how a kid might attack that pitch that we're looking for that pitch on the outer half that we don't want to just guide over to the opposite field, but we want to drive it uh, to the opposite field. And then – Another thing that I like to use as opposed to, um, you know, and this is just personal preference because I personally was never a guy that was, um, I felt like if I sat on pitches and, and this is my own bias, which obviously we all have as coaches and we try to work out um, because not everybody's the same, but I always felt like if I was going to sit on a slider or an off-speed pitch and the pitcher threw that pitch, I didn't verify that it was a strike before I swung. So I think we've all seen it where, hey, we know this guy's going to slider us to death, so let's sit on that slider. And all of a sudden we're swinging at, you know, 48 footers that shouldn't, you know, we're swinging out of the hand, should never pull the trigger on. Um, so what I like to talk about is anticipating pitches or anticipating zones. They aren't really exactly the same, but they're similar for me. So if I'm anticipating a pitch, uh, hey, I just have a good feeling, man, I squared a fastball up in my last at bat. I think he's going to stay soft to me this at bat. I'm going to anticipate that. I'm going to expect it, but anticipate, that doesn't mean I have to swing at it. And that's kind of how I put it to our guys. And I think that I still have to verify with my eyes that it's a pitch that I want to hit um, and not just pull the trigger because I wanted spin and I saw spin and now I'm swinging at a pitch I shouldn't swing at. So I think that that's, um, you know, just terminology wise, you know, going back to the question, it's kind of two things that stuck out to me um, that, you know, like I said, we have our own personal terminology that, you know, we, we phrase, um, it's nothing crazy or special. It's just unique to our program. Um, and then one thing I want to touch on that coach Hart said, uh, about moving around in the box. And I thought he put it so well is 
we want our guys to take complete ownership um, of themselves, of their at bats, uh, of their career. And in order to do that, you know, we can mandate things and we do have to mandate things sometimes, but the moment you can get a guy, when you educate them and they can start to make their own uh, moves based on uh, something that they want to do and not something they're forced to do, they, they do a lot better job taking ownership of that and, and really buying into it, uh, which is a cliche term, but you know, it's important. Uh, and, and the more ownership you can give a kid within his own at bat, within his own career, within his own swing, the more receptive he's going to be to suggestions, to change, to criticism. So I think that that's an important thing, and he touched on it, and I, I definitely thought that was valuable um, for all of us. It's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you, Coach. I think the, uh, the, the redefining what oppo means was huge. Um, yeah, I mean, glove side of the shortstop for a right-handed hitter, effectively. It makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, D, now I'm not going to ask you to go uh, spill the beans on what the Rockies do because I understand the value uh, financially of a Major League Baseball win. Um, so I don't want to kind of put you, paint you into a corner there. But I am curious to find out you work with some of the most talented baseball players in, in the world. Um, I'm sure there's some guys who mentally really struggle putting this together when you try to teach them to be a professional hitter and have an approach and their entire life they've been, I just see it and I hit it real good. Um, yeah. How do you balance that? Yeah, it's a, uh, um, you know, clarity is a big thing. In fact, if you can put my fifth slide up there, that would be awesome. Has a plan intent and approach up there, all of them on there. Um, the, uh, the process it's the interesting piece of, of what happens is, is, all guys, it doesn't matter what the level is, right? All guys still need some help, some nudge, uh, some, you know, being the, being the, on the side of the road, letting them work through the path of what their path is and how they're going to get to this, this uh, pitch, how they're going to get to this next at bat, how they're going to move through that. You're just trying to keep them in, in, in the middle of the road as you go down. But like when you look at this, some of the terms that, uh, that we've already talked about today, uh, all of us have, <clears throat> with the plan, just the game plan that matches the strengths of the pitches you're facing, right? You need to know what can you eliminate pitches? Can you go up there and uh, if you know the sink or the move or the, or the shape of the, of the pitch as it's going on, do you have to push them out? Do you have to push them in, push them up in the zone as you go? Uh, intent is a, is a huge, huge word. Uh, can, with, with the intent that you bring, and then you look at the result of what happened, something in the middle either helped you get, helped you get that result or, didn't help you get that result. Were you strong enough within the, that intent? Did you actually follow through with what the intent was? Um, but that along with the, the you know, talk about intentional with your thoughts, we already said that, but uh, allowing your eyes to, to really just be soft and gaze, gaze into certain areas and then be able to come back to your visual instincts and let them help you with your decisions are huge. You know, the story of the pitch and the story of the swing is what are we, what are we in charge of and how can we manage and and self-evaluate on the story of our swing uh the pitch we we have some knowledge we have some we have some of that from the plan that we already had uh and then to the approach very simple it's uh you know it'll always adjust to what the game is telling us it needs if the guy cannot the guy cannot throw a pitch on the inner half and you are a middle end guy uh, like we like coach hart and i always wanted to look for and try to find <laughs> If he, but if he, he does not throw it ever in there, and he's always a right-handed or left-handed hitter, he's a right-handed arm miss guy, you know, maybe you push him up, the chances of him coming in are pretty slim. So, But then the last one is, is really important, too, the strength of your approach. When you have your approach, so many times the approach gets left behind after pitch one or pitch three or an umpire screws you on a pitch, which has never happened in any level of baseball, right? <laughs> um, how we actually react to the next piece is honestly almost everything. And so that, that response, that, that how we actually go about it, uh, how stubborn are you and how tough are you to be able to mentally turn the page like we talked about already, but then still have the strength of your approach. We can have an approach as much as we want, but if it changes after a guy throws a certain pitch and you're like, no, that must be different and this and whatever, and you, you automatically change your approach, you're in trouble and it comes down to that pitch discipline. If you are hunting a specific pitch, and you're hunting that area and you on OO count 
swing at a slider down and in and you roll over to the four hole, how was your strength of your approach? And how was the pitch discipline for you? And uh, Jerry Weinstein is one of my favorite guys to sit down and talk. And I know you guys all know him and he's a legend and all that stuff, but you don't hunt polar bears in Florida. So, you know, as you're hunting for your pitch, that's a, that's a quote that I'll always remember and always use from him. As you're hunting your pitch, man, you stay on that pitch. The strength of your approach is going to hopefully play out with how your swing is, is going, especially that day or whatever. But um, those things are huge. And some, a lot of times the approach is going to actually influence your mechanics to be what it needs to be to get the job done. And uh, so but oh, there's a couple things right there. And, and uh, you know, we, every, everyone needs that guidance, a little bit of a nudge. Some guys need more of a push. But, uh, you know, if, if it becomes their idea, and a couple of guys have already talked about it, if it becomes their idea and if it's important to them and it actually came from them or a teammate, they're going to they're gonna have that in their uh, their uh, toolbox way stronger in their strength of their approach than if it was given to them by a coach. Nice, nice. JR, real quick, can I make one point just to add? It's yeah. such a good point that Darren made. Um, one thing that uh, that I think is important for especially the younger hitters that we we deal with at the college level, and then you know the coaches that deal with even younger than that, is pitchers are trying to set you up a lot of times, and sometimes our hitters aren't smart enough to realize that you know a fastball up and in might be setting you up for another pitch. So when he talked about this, how stubborn are you and, and the strength of your approach, I think sometimes you have to protect these guys to understand that every, you know, especially at the college level where a lot of pitching coaches are calling pitches for their guys. Um, they're, they're making a pitch in order to set up another pitch. And if you go into the next pitch worried about the last pitch and don't have a short memory, you can find yourself, you know, chasing your tail uh, in a game. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you, coach. Um, yeah. And if you guys ever have anything you want to add, nobody wants to hear me talk, but they came here to hear y'all talk. So feel free to just jump in. Um, Garbs, I'm really curious. How do you assess this? You, you can't climb into a player's brain. Um, I mean, maybe you can to a certain extent. How are you assessing their approach? What uh, do you have anything that you do? Are you charting anything? Are you looking at video? Or is it just a conversation with your hitters? Uh, I think it has to be individual as much as possible. Uh, some guys love video. Some guys don't like video. Uh, and that's where getting to know the player is very important. Uh, when we start in the fall, we don't really – we just let our guys get swings and let them get comfortable. We want to see what they do. We want to learn about them. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we pay attention to is where do they swing the ball? Where do they hit the ball hard? And then we want to have those discussions with them because I learned early on, um, we had a guy and I used to tell him, dude, you hit the ball outer half so well. And we'd get to a game and he would take the pitch. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? That's the ball you crush. You, you swing. He's like, well, finally, I come to learn that that pitch was not outside to him. That pitch was middle. So I had, to, I had to learn how to speak his, uh, his language. You know, like I saw that pitch from my perspective as outside. Well, in his perspective in the box, that pitch was more middle. So I needed to tell him, hey, dude, swing at the ball down the middle, bro. You know? Yeah. And not swing at the pitch outside, which for me was outside. So that – there's a lot of interaction, and I think it's all on to us and – uh, each other the players learn a lot from each other because it's so innocent the comments they make they're, they'll make comments when they're working with each other like dude you can't hit that inside pitch and they'll be like what do you mean you know and it's just innocent between each other that then competition and innocent comments put guys in positions where they're forced to adjust on their own as and get better you know, like you'll throw BP to a guy, right? How many times the guys adjust on their own? I think it's natural for people to adjust. Like you'll throw BP to a guy, right? And if it's too soft, what does that guy do immediately? Moves up in the box on you, yeah. right? He's adjusting. And that's, that's approach. I am throwing too soft. So, hey, dude, can you do that in the game? You know what I mean? When you're out in front and you're killing the third base coach over there, can you do that? Can you do what you do to me when we throw BP? Now we're talking about approach. Now we're talking about adjusting. So uh, long answer for your question there, JR. Sorry, but it's uh, it, for us at our program is get to know our guys as best we can so that we can help them be better at themselves. 
No, that's, that's awesome. Thank you, coach. By the way, um, Brownie's been blowing me up. He, he just said two <laughs> of my greatest mentors, Garbs and Evie together on an ABCA at home. So I had to give him a shout out, but, um, huh. but yeah. Um, Wonderful person, Brownie. Oh, Thank you. No doubt. No doubt. Coach Hart. Um, I don't know if uh, you want to get into assessment stuff, if that's something sure. you do. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not, I mean, you guys do. We, you know, we do a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff of what Rudy just said is, is absolutely right on. Um, you know, we chart VP, we chart stuff in the cages sometimes. Uh, you know, we're going to keep a quality at bat chart in all of our scrimmages and, and you know, in the fall and the spring scrimmages, we're going to keep, like I said, a, a quality at bat chart. But more, more than anything, you know, it's just a daily watching your guys. It's watching your guys sit there and whether it's BP or T work or front toss. And in my opinion, you should be able to tell you know, what they're doing. And then when they come out of there, if I ask them, hey, what approach did you have? And they say, hey, I was red line, red line, fastball spit. And they were getting blown up by BP. You know, then it's an easy conversation to have that, listen, if we're fastball spit, then, you know, you can't be late on fastballs. It's, it's the actual approach that you're saying you're doing, you're not executing. And I think that comes back, you know, it goes back to, in my opinion, an overlooked part of approach is strictly just truly being rhythm and timing a fastball. Can you truly rhythm and time a fastball? Because if you can't do that, then I think before you even start talking to hitters about approach, like they have to learn how to rhythm and time a fastball in order to get into any sort of approach. Easy enough. Easy enough. Like, I'm curious if uh, if you have any assessment uh, stuff that you've used previously, because you have a pretty detailed breakdown of what your expectations are in regards to, um, you know, the 11 inches, the 22 inches. How are you holding your your hitters accountable to those things in games or even in yeah. practice preseason? You know, back in the day when we could only have four people for skill work, I tried to come up with a way to score the quality of the at bat when there was no defense mm -hmm. and all I knew going in was I thought I could break contact down into three levels, three being flush. I'm not talking about angle of contact. I'm just mm -hmm. the sound and the, yeah. it could be a ground ball or a, a fly ball. Um, a two would be average and a one is garbage. I knew that. And I knew when they struck out and I knew when they walked. That's really all I knew. So part of our fall and preseason, when you had to do it in groups of four, I tried to come up with a way to grade it. And what we did this preseason at Notre Dame when we were indoors, we did the invert type chart for the pitching because the pitching is really trying to do the opposite of what we're trying to do. Yeah. And we came up with two great charts. That being said, three contact for us in everything that you do is not off the T. Obviously, the exit speed off a T will not be the same as it is off of right. a 95 mile an hour, but there's still the feel of flushing a ball up on the sweet spot. It was pure. So, if you're dealing with the 11 inch less than two strike zone, whether it's, you know, we call it blue to blue, Chris is red to red, sit away, sit in, sit off speed, all of that is less than two strike hitting. If it's not a three-grade contact on the machine in BP off the tee, then the self-assessment happens. Like, I want it to happen every swing they take, every day, at every station, period. Um, when we get to two strikes, then that's out the window for me a little bit. I, I'll deal with a good adjustment to put a good slider. Just do your best to hang in there and put it in play. Yeah. That assessment is totally different. At that point, our goal is to is to battle and put it in play and not and not essentially strike out. When we walk up to the plate, our goal is three quality contact with a pitch in that 11 inch lane with whatever rhythm you're on. Fastball and spit, fastball just or sit off speed. So the assessment that we try to get across from day 1 is that we are strictly three contact and they need to know what three contact feels like off the machine on the field BP in a game off the tee front toss, all of it. 
that's that's where we start. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. RP, every time I'm about to come to you, I hear a dog barking in the background. Is that just is that just the husky back there in you or, or what's going on? That's my five month old Rottweiler that uh just doesn't know that I'm on a call right now. So. <laughs> I know that's not Coach Hart's dog. <laughs> Certainly is not. And I can tell you right now, Ron, I'm never coming to your house. <laughs> RP, any uh, any assessment tools that that help you uh, build this approach and teach this approach with your players? Um, you know, I, I think keeping keep, like keeping the approach basic for them and giving them visuals. I think as far as like attacking areas in a cage is important. Um, you know, I, I I believe that each guy obviously has their different strengths and weaknesses. We do a lot to. Uh, through questionnaires probably four times throughout the fall. A lot of times it's the same question, but kind of a starting point, kind of a point right when we're getting into it, you know, more than halfway through and then right before they leave for Christmas break, just kind of assessing um, what they're doing well, what they, you know, what they really like, um, what's helping them, what's not helping them, just to kind of help get in their, in their brain, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is the trick for all of us as hitting coaches because I spend a lot more of my time more as like, I wouldn't say psychologist because I'm not that smart, but, um, you know, more of like just trying to get into their brain and understand what they're thinking. So those help me a lot as far as assessing kind of where they're at within themselves and within their mechanic of their swing or their thought process. Um, so, and then, you know, when we're just talking about timing a little bit was coming up and I think one of the biggest thing that, that we've tried to do and we're going to continue to try to do is, is the whole like, you know, everybody talks about how I can't take something. To, it's hard to take something to the game. So you might be great in your front toss. You can do it in your BP. Um, you might even be able to do it off of like a velocity machine or a slider machine. But then when you go into the game, it speeds up on you. So I think that one of the timing pieces, because timing is such an important part, uh, you can throw a lot of stuff out the window, a great swing, a great approach. Um, a great mentality, a great competitive mentality, great, great eyes, great hand eye, all that. You can throw it out the window if your timing's bad. If you have really bad timing, you're going to struggle. So uh, one of the things that I like to do is try to drill guys. Um, maybe uh, drills that we would normally only do in like a front toss setting. We'll make them go do it in BP as well. Make them do it off of a velocity machine as well and try to keep the same uh, idea through the, through the drill, through the mechanic. Because I, you know, for, you know, to do a, like a feet together where you're leaving your heels through the ground or even a feet, a wide heels through the ground drill off of a velocity machine is different than trying to do it off of a front toss. But it's also an easy way to transition to carrying what you're trying to get out of the drill into a game setting. So, and the other point that I would make on timing, um, just because it was brought up is timing a lot of guys will know when it's right, but they don't understand when it's wrong, why it's wrong. So uh, we talk about front toss where if you break a hitter down there from the moment they start to make a move, whether it's to sit into that back hip or whether it's a, a negative backward move or whatever the actual first starting point is to the moment of contact in a front toss setting might be a long time. It might be like one and a half seconds and we're all trying to teach slow to fast. It's an important thing to understand that preload to, to go slow to fast. But then when they get into a game setting and the ki the kids are one, two to the plate, cause everybody on the West coast at least is, is trying to, you know, make sure they shut the run game down in the small game. So we got guys coming fast to the plate and they're trying to get ready faster than what they've practiced. So I think it's important to try to teach them what it feels like to be late. And you can do that through different drills and also what it feels like to be, you know, start too early or leg lift too early or whatever, they might be doing. Um, and then once you teach them that and they can feel it, it's easier for them to assess it when it's happening to them instead of just, Hey, that felt good. Remember that good feeling, but they don't know what it feels like when it's bad or why it's bad. So. No doubt. No doubt. Now I'm, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot by asking this, especially with this panel that we have up here. But um, RP, I'm kind of curious since you got on the timing platform, I played drums my whole life. And I grew up practicing to a metronome, a click, something that is consistent. What do you think about just putting a ball on a tee with, with a metronome to work on timing and trying to hit the ball on that click? I know it's a 
auditory stimulus. It's not a visual stimulus. There's no ball, but how are ways, what are ways that you've had success working with, with timing with guys just pointing out? Yes. Yeah. You're on time. No, I, I think, uh, well, first off, I want to see you on the drums before this is over. I think that's fair <laughs> for all of us. I mean, they're um, all, uh, they're set up over there. Well, hey, it's going to be easy are. for you. You can see them. See, uh, all- no, what, what I actually think um, is, is important is, especially when I'm trying to teach early, late, or on time, is, uh, you know, I, I did spend some time with Doug Latta, and I, I take a lot of his stuff, so I'm not trying to you know, claim ownership on it or anything, which we all do, of course, um, cause we're all trying to get better. That's why we're on here and that's why people are listening. Um, but you know, he uses a go timing and his is kind of go and then drops a ball, maybe in a machine. And I've kind of t- taken that and made it my own, but, um, I will actually like go and drop almost simultaneously. And when I do that, if I time it out with a velo machine, it's about 0.75 seconds from the moment I say go to when it's crossing the plate. Um, and then if I say one go, it goes to more of that 1.1 seconds. And then if I say two, one go, it's more in like the one, four to one, five range. Uh, so I use that and we'll maybe station three cages next to each other, which, you know, I know not everybody has the resources and I try to be aware of that, especially when I'm trying to do these things that, you know, not everybody can have three full tunnels with a, a velocity machine throwing 90, uh, and we are fortunate to have five tunnels to be able to do stuff like that. But I might have just the go timing where everybody feels beat. They feel like the ball's on them um, because I'm not, I'm not doing a cadence. It's just go and then the ball's on them to a one go, which is more like real life game timing uh, to a two one go, uh, which is, is more of um, it's, it's early for a lot of guys. I try to make them start as soon as I say the two uh, and, and so as far as your cadence, I think that that's, um, I think that that's similar to kind of what you're saying. I think there's something mm-hmm. too, as we've talked about adjustability through the swing and, and kind of creating space. And that's becoming a hot topic right now. Um, instead of having a visual cue all the time, it's almost more difficult to just have an audible cue. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and then understand if I start a little early or a little late, how adjustable can I be within my own body uh, to be successful within that swing? That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, coach. Now uh, we're going to go to Twitter for our next question and I'm going to pull it up here. It's from uh, Matthew Chandler. Um, He wants to know what everybody's core absolutes of your two strike approach and uh, how often, how often do you work on it? Um, D we'll, we'll start with you. And I'm assuming there's, there may be guys or times with runners in scoring position that you really yeah, maybe it's not so much about a two strike approach. It's still just I can get the barrel out there. Um, yeah, w- but uh, we'll start with you. Two strike approach, core absolutes. How often do you work on it? Yeah, for us, it's all individualized and uh, kind of goes back to RP with uh, w- a big questionnaire guy. So I think the questionnaire, the answer you get from them and reading through them with intent yourself, they really, those self, it's, it's telling you how much they self evaluate themselves, how, how well they do it. And it really cr- helps create some just creative and powerful uh, teaching times when you get the back together and you say, hey, I, I read this and, and going into this and tell me more about that. You know, get more involved in that. Um, the, uh, the, the, those things are huge. The two strike approach for us uh, and really for, for me is, is really it's got to be individualized. Some guys like to choke up. Some guys don't. I know there's uh, programs and stuff that, that everything's mandatory. When I played with the Expos, we were mandatory inch and a half up or inch off. We had to see, you had to be able to see space between the knob and your hand. Uh, kind of like the socks back then too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you had to see socks. Um, but uh, that was, that was real. Um, I didn't mind that. And for me, it was, it, it worked into what I was doing. I hated, I hated striking out with a passion. That is still my thing, but there are different buckets of strikeouts too. You know, and there's certain times where a strikeout is different than, a, than in a, a team at bat situation where you're haven't got a, a chance to move a guy or have a chance to score a guy. That type of stuff can be uh, obviously very varied and different. So for me, it's it's uh, or for us, it is it's very much a uh, individualized to the guys. And you know, we try to we try to do different things in terms of making sure we. I think we all would agree on the mantra of of us. Uh, you know, hit strikes and take balls, right? 
But when you get the two strikes, I think it's even more important that you that you learn how to take balls. And so, we, yeah, we, we have separate two strike accounts, two two strike rounds, multiple different things, different situations, game situations, uh, pitching machine situations, challenge drills, that type of stuff. <clears throat> a two strike approach with with like a space and time ladder challenge where they're actually coming closer to you either off a machine. If you don't have a machine and you're just pitching, man. One of the best things you can do is do like that, that ladder and have them actually come closer to you. Not everyone's got that machine, right? And I've been in programs like that before. And, um, you know, we're all fortunate to have that. But you don't have the machine, man, move up. And now it's still it's still a two-strike. Our biggest thing is we don't want to get too defensive. We we are not into slapping, uh, slapping to slap or make contact to make contact. Um, at times, you need something like that. And those, those at-bats can still be good in a team at-bat. But for us, we are still trying to find a pitch in the middle third of the plate that we can hopefully uh, handle and do some damage with out front. And uh, if we can, hopefully we can recognize the lanes of the strike zone and the tunneling of, uh, you know, they're tunneling us through their, with their releasing the pitch. We're trying to tunnel to our zones that we can really be good at. So I think if we can do that a little bit and be able to still have balance and still have the same movement that we have when our, with our regular swing movement, meaning how is your pelvis moving, all that stuff, uh, and not just giving in on that unless it's, like I said, that game, game big-time situation where the uh, getting them over type situation might be a little bit different situation. But mm-hmm. um, it is so individualized. We've had multiple players that came in from different programs that either didn't have the mandatory or did have a mandatory, but then they try to, hey, I'm going to widen up and I'm going to choke up. Well, when they went to their regular, we give them the option. Like it's, hey, if it works for you and, they, and the numbers prove it out, great. But, if, you know, why are you struggling? Well, I'm trying to do this and this and this. How about you try to do nothing? <laughs> and maybe shorten up, maybe it's just a little bit and just try to be you. Try to see the ball in the lane that you're good at. And how about let's hit the ball and just try to be simple, up the middle. Um, so much, you know, I, I do, I use a lot of Doug Otto stuff as well. And, and just keeping it simple and allowing the pitcher to make some mistakes over the plate uh, with two strikes is, is really important. So um, kind of get long winded on that one, but the, the vision of where the, of what we see is huge, making them, making them throw a strike. Don't get beat on a ball at the, you know, we're trying to eliminate the chase. So. Easy enough. Easy enough. Garbs. What about, uh, what about you? Any uh, tried tested, um, two strike approaches, or is it individual over at Lynn as well? A uh, very individualized, uh, Darren RP. These guys, they've said a great thing. But let me ask you. Like, let me kind of throw a question back uh, to give you a little insight as to how we look at it. Is all right. What's your one O approach? You know, what's your three one approach? Um, you know, conceptually, isn't it the same? The only thing that has changed are the goals. Maybe as Darren said, we're trying to hit strikes with two strikes you know, and take the balls. Now we're looking for different pitches, perhaps three, one or one. Oh, so really our approach is based on the goal for that at bat. Some, you know, for some of our guys, it's pretty simple. Look, when we get the two strikes, we want to, our goal is simple. See three or more pitches, you know, put the ball in play and hit a strike. Those are three simple, basic fundamentals. Now you've got a big slow guy, you know, and, and uh, he was a, he, this guy was, impressive and when he got hit by pitches back in my day when I was young it was Don Baylor but he was a manager and it's one of my favorite quotes ever he says you know talk about this for a two-strike approach he said if you even think you're going to hit into a double play strike out so you know we've got a whole individualized difference of approach but for us it's based on the goal of whatever the pitch count or where the pitcher is you know 2-0. 2-0. What's your approach? 2-0. Are, are we going to come out of our shoes and foul a ball off a pull side? That's not good approach, you know? Um, very similar to, to maybe chasing or uh, taking or, or swinging at only strikes with two strikes. Um, and with the ladder drill, where, where we find a lot of our guys is they don't like moving away. When you move them back and you slow it down, they struggle a lot more than they like it when you get closer. Yeah, I get to get gear up and get closer and closer and closer. But they, you force them to actually work harder when you move them back for us, for our guys. That's right. That's right. Easy enough. Now, Coach Hart, my 
O2 approach, one, two, two strike approach. When I played, if I got to two strikes, I was swinging at the next pitch, no matter what. Didn't matter. I didn't care. I was swinging. I'm not saying that that's right at all. What do you guys do at North Carolina State? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to go back to what Link said earlier, you know, about three contact. You know, less than two strikes, we're doing the exact same thing. We want three contact. We want a driven baseball. We're deciding on which pitch we want to hit. And we want our guys to decide on the pitch that they can make three contact with. Once we get to two strikes, the three contact for us goes out the window. It, it's, it's more about barrel control, squaring that thing up. Well, I shouldn't say it goes out the window. I should say it's more about just squaring the baseball up rather than trying to hit the baseball, you know, with everything we have. It's about barrel control. It's about, you know, making sure that we can have a, a barrel adjustment to get that barrel on the ball. Now, how do we do that? We automatically say we're sitting away. So we take our red lines and we shift them out, especially in college baseball. You know, Darren's got a little bit different strike zone than we have to deal with. You know, there's, there's guys in, you know, at our level that, you know, they're going to call stuff a ball or two balls off the plate sometimes. And, and, you know, you can't just sit there and come back to the dugout and say, oh, it's a ball. Like, well, you're out. So we have to be able to defend with it. You know, you have to be able to have some sort of defense for that. So we automatically sit away. Um, then obviously with that being said, with two strikes, you have to expand that red line in all the way to the corner for us to say you're covering a, a lot bigger plate. Um, if we look out, so our guys are still looking away. They're sitting away. They're looking away. It allows them to have a chance to fight on that inside point. If that guy comes in with 94 in, we understand it's going to be tough. I, we completely get it. I'm never going to yell at a guy, you know, and say, you know, what the heck, man? Like, we understand that's going to be a tough situation. But with that being said, I think it's probably the hardest pitch in baseball. It's guys are a little bit nervous to do it how many guys at our level can consistently throw in there, you know, if they get us in there, fine. Now we also practice this stuff all the time, you know, with T drills, front toss, BP, machine work, you know, everything we're doing, you know, we, we practice a two strike approach and mid swing adjustments. Um, you know, we'll put a T up and in and say, listen, it's two strikes. Try, you have to be able to pull your hands inside and fight this thing you know, up the middle, um, the next pitch, put a T low T down and away and say, listen, you're fooled. The T is way out in front and six inches off the ground, but you're fooled with a really good breaking ball right on right. Can you mid swing adjust? Can you make your body adjust? And even if it's a one hand butt out flick and you flick that thing over the shortstop's head, that's a big time win. Even if you flick it into the stands, like you got fooled. We're all going to be fooled at times, but the really good ones, the really great ones can make those mid swing adjustments to, like I said, even if foul off into the stands, they, they, they fought to live another day. They might get the favor and get the fastball and red line away the next pitch and smoke it, which I saw a video the other day of Tony Gwynn, you know, doing, you know, Randy Johnson, you guys probably saw it. Yeah, it, yeah. it was one, two count. <laughs> Randy Johnson throws him a left on left slider and I, I slow mode it and he's, but out, he gets up on his tippy toes and one hands the thing down the left field line for a double. Like that's what's that's what's hitting is all about. Like that mid swing adjustment to be able to sit there and put yourself in that awkward position and still find the barrel to that baseball. That's what really separates for me the good hitters to the great hitters. Like those guys can can really do those mid swing adjustments to find a way to barrel that baseball up. So. No doubt. Now, when you, uh, Coach Hart, when you went to, have you always taught your hitters, like, hey, we're going to be two strikes, we're going to be sitting hard away, fastball rhythm, looking for something away, just try to adjust in. Have you always done that? And if so, um, did you notice uh, anything different when they started getting more breaking pitches with two strikes? Were they able to handle the breaking ball a little bit more by having this mentality? Yeah, I, I mean, that's part of the reason why, you know, you sit away is one to cover. And then two, it gives you a little more time, you know, to adjust, you know, if you're sitting fastball in, obviously you're not going to cover and it speeds up, you know, the off speed and, and the contact position and all that. So, like I said, we, you know, you have to practice these things and you have to practice putting yourselves in those awkward positions and, 
to get guys to feel really to feel comfortable being uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable position, you know, to, to be two strikes is uncomfortable to be butt out and one handing that ball over the shortstop's head. It's not what we want. Like nobody wants to be in that position, but we're going to be in those positions at times. And like I said, that's why you have to get to a feeling where you're, you're comfortable being uncomfortable in two strikes. And once you get to that level, and really feel comfortable with two strikes, I think you, you've elevated yourself to a really, really good hitter. It's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you, Coach. Link, what about you? Any hard uh, hard rules, dead set, we're doing this with two strikes? What do you got? Well, like Chris, cover away, cover fastball away, but we try to make sure they keep fastball rhythm. And, and the further away you focus, ideally the contact point is a little deeper. But if you keep fastball rhythm as you look away and, um, again, try to let the ball travel a little bit, I think you help yourself. And um, being in a great position to hit with your barrel set in a great clean position does give you a little more time to wait. Um, and that does factor into your success with or without two strikes. Um, so, so that is important that you're athletic and clean in your launch. Um, I would say that 70% of our breaking ball work in the cage is with two strikes and we're not throwing 85 mile an hour breaking balls in the cage. If you put the gun on it, they're probably 74 mile an hour breaking balls, but from 54 feet indoors that it's about 90% velocity scale. That seems to be realistic. It's still tough. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we, we do a lot of work with two strikes. We do T work with two strikes, but that machine, um, even with fastballs, when you expand and challenge them and, and really work the, what the 22 inch zone becomes with two strikes, they start to develop their own tactics to manage how they hit with two strikes because we work on it so much and we do it on the field. Um, if you watched our BP, there would be quite a difference between obviously the less than two strike rounds and the two strike rounds. I do not do two strike rounds pregame BP on the field. I, I don't do that. But at practice, we do far more ratio in the cage with two strike stuff off the machine. That is the highest ratio of two strike hitting. Does it match the number of that bats and pitches that we see? out of two strike counts. I, I couldn't tell you that, but I know that the, the repetition off tough breaking stuff, right on right, right on left, left on left, left on right, all of it, the more comfortable they can become maintaining fastball rhythm and adjusting to those off speed pitches. Um, that seems to give you the best success rate with two strikes. Now, coach, I'm uh, you, you keep saying fastball rhythm. Um, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that this is what I have on this slide, but I wanted to see if this video kind of dictates what fastball rhythm is. This is A-Rod hitting El Duque throwing. Don't pay, nobody pay any attention to the, the words on it. Just watch the video. I watched him on Shark Tank last night. <laughs> <laughs> but is that what you mean by kind of he stayed in his fastball that, rhythm that's a tremendous adjustment that is a mid-pitch adjustment and okay that's what he was mean. timing a fastball and then that that hold in your launch position um if you can hold it at at toe touch and still not quite go to heel plant I think you'll see him probably be on the ball of his foot just long enough that he still can drive that heel into the ground when it's time to actually swing. But there's a big pause in between what would be fastball rhythm and then his actual ability to adjust. He's at toe touch for a long time and still maintain an athletic position enough to just hang in there and wait, wait, wait. And, you know, obviously show off his talent and still drive a ball completely out of sync. I guess when I go fastball rhythm, I want our hitters to feel like when I'm on the tee, if I put the tee, you just, I'll let them do it. Put the tee wherever you want. This is your, your favorite pitch. It's a fastball. 
you can move it even with your stride foot out in front, hit it. And that, that feeling of perfection with your swing is ultimately what fastball rhythm should feel like in a game. I'm not saying that's easy, but it's really your responsibility as a hitter to, to find the feel for that fastball on the swing you've trained hundreds of thousands of times. Whether the fastball is 86 or 96, you have to gauge that. If you're sitting off speed, if A-Rod had sat on that pitch, his rhythm would have been far different than yes. it was as a mid-pitch adjustment. Yeah. Makes sense. I just said uh, we've heard the term a couple of times this evening, so I wanted to try to get a visual for you there. Plus, I mean, it's always nice watching guys hit balls over the fence, and especially in that situation when you got two of the, the best to have played it. Um, yeah. Now, we're getting close to the end of our time, but RP, I, I'm very curious to find out if you guys have anything that you do um, up at the University of Washington with, with two strikes. Yeah, we, you know, we, uh, we definitely value as much as, as we can in today's game. Like we, we don't want guys to strike out. I mean, it's pretty, sounds pretty simple, but we want to make our guys put the baseball in play and, uh, put it in play hard for us to strike hitting is completely a mentality. Um, and sometimes when people say that it's like, okay, mentality, like it doesn't mean that necessarily that you're tough with two strikes or that you're tougher. What it means is your mentality doesn't force you to get out of what you what makes you successful so you're you have a mentality that doesn't allow you to uh get so gooned out that you chase a pitch um you know and, and i think that the best the best hitters you have they don't mind hitting with two strikes uh the best guys in your lineup we had nick kale last year who was a fourth rounder to the brewers and there was a point almost two-thirds of the way through the season where he's hitting over 600 with two strikes and that wasn't because Nick um, did anything other than he was a catcher. He trusted his eyes. He trusted his swing. Um, he trusted his zone uh, presence and understanding where strikes and balls were. Um, so he didn't punch, and he, he wasn't afraid to hit with two strikes. Now, that being said, there's seven or eight other guys in our lineup that aren't that guy, you know, that we're going to have to make sure that we understand their, uh, their struggles with two strikes. And um, I think the biggest thing that we can teach our guys – uh, is, and, and something that I'll often say to them is, is while we want you to not strike out and we want you to not strike out looking and we want you to handle the plate and expand the zone if needed, blah, blah, blah. Well, all of a sudden you start to deflate them a little bit to where they become passive. And the biggest thing that you can have with two strikes is, is still that aggressive mentality. If, if you start getting in the box, especially, you know, the, the guys that we're facing on a Friday night and you go two strikes and and you're passive and he, he's going to throw 93, 94 right by you. Um, so I think you have to keep them in an attack mode, so to speak. Um, and then addressing the team, the more you crush them on, Hey, we can't strike out. We struck out too much. Now there's a time and a place where you have to do that, of course, but it becomes like not hitting with runners in scoring position. And all of a sudden the thing that you're trying to help them get better at is some, you're actually just, you know, you're sticking them in the side with it and you're, you're making it worse. So I think you have to stay um, more on the mindset of uh, of just trying to keep them aggressive in the zone. Uh, one interesting thing that I think is really hard to apply to our level, and, and my last point, that you know I played I played college baseball with Justin Turner, and we haven't I haven't had the chance to talk hitting with him in a really long time. But every time I do get the opportunity, I obviously listen because um, he's just evolved into one of the best in the game. But one of the things he'll tell me and we are talking about a big league zone here, is that he actually shoeboxes the zone. He shrinks it, um, which is a, an extremely unique perspective uh, because for him, in, in his, his purpose and his mentality toward it was the bigger I make the zone, the more I start to chase and swing at balls. Uh, if I can shoebox the zone, because the umpires are so good, I'll take a pitch and I'm like, man, that might be a strike, and they ball it. Um, so – you know, he is dealing with a different zone. He's dealing with umpires that are, you know, um, pretty incredible, to be honest. So, uh, but I thought it was a unique perspective. Um, it just, it, it was kind of the opposite of everything that I was taught my whole life growing up. RP, did you, were you on the 2016 Fullerton? Uh, no, 03 through 05. I'll tell you, we played them in 06. I was coaching East Carolina and 
Justin Turner and Blake Davis. I can't remember that whole. You probably know all of them. Yeah. One of the best teams I ever competed against, bar none. Yeah, it was a special group. I mean, the coaching staff, the players alike. I mean, uh, I was the only infielder that didn't make it to the big leagues. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, no, we had a great group. It was, it was a pretty awesome time. In Turner played second base, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Blake Davis played short. Yeah. And I, I was playing third. Oh six. Oh six was Evan MacArthur, but I was playing third base. Oh three to oh five. Was Wes Romer on that team? Yeah. In oh five. Pull up yeah. Wes when you when we get done, look up Wes Romer's stats in two thousand six. It was like hundred and fifty strikeouts and how many people did he walk? Like three? Yeah, and he'd hit you instead of walking. <laughs> so pull up those stats later. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, gentlemen, um, my clock still says 930, so I've got one more question for the whole panel. We'll just kind of go around the horn. And it, it's not so much a question as much as, um, you know, kind of get on your soapbox. What do you want to uh, – what do you want to say to the, you know, roughly 2,000 coaches out there listening, wanting to learn more about approach, wanting to learn how to train it, how to assess it, how to, how to get their players to buy into it? Um, yeah, kind of preach, uh, preach the uh, the word of approach in regards to hitting, and um, yeah, E, we'll start with you. Yeah, approach. I tell you, there's a so much of approach is gaining some knowledge, right, and then being able to use that knowledge in the box and getting you know kind of funneling into one thought. So you're up there competing like crazy, and I really believe uh, of, of the importance of journaling. I played for Scott Berry back in the day at Mayville State and uh, Hall of Famer with ABCA. And uh, he'd have, have us journal. <laughs> and, you know, a 20-year-old kid going, what are we doing? And, and, and I was not much of a reader back then. <clears throat> but I tell you what, I, I have so many journals around this house now and all that stuff. We talk about journaling all the time. Our players have a journal. Uh, they're given one. Hopefully they use it. But also using the technology of their phones, uh, the notes, packages that they have. You know, being able to write information down, previous at-bats, uh, this will kind of age me a little bit, but I have all every pitch of every minor league at-bat that I had when I played. And it's uh, my was all carried around in a, in a uh, little binder um, with a zip zipper on it to make sure it didn't fall out. And, you know, the importance of knowing what you did and then being able to self-evaluate on how you responded to the pitch, how, how the shape of the pitch was, and you can write it down in a journal in your words. I think it's huge. I think that part of it, uh, we all learn differently. Each player's journal looks differently. We can give them the same book, uh, give them an always grind book or whatever, and the, it'll look totally different from one guy to the next. But the more times that you can actually give a guy uh, at least a medium to actually, hey, this is, this is going to help you. And if, even if you write down a few things here and there, and then eventually picks up into more items that they're writing down, now they start writing everything down. And like for all of our hitters, uh, parties or I hate calling meetings, but we, we all, we, we always have too many meetings, right? But all of our, all of our meetings are hitting hot stove items that we have when we get together, you know, they're required to have their, their journal with them and to be able to write down some certain things. And then for me or us to be able to say, Hey, this is important, right? Make sure we write this down. That learning process is huge. Um, I really think it can help advance players faster. It can also help them bring up different items to you with what they're feeling, because not only do we want them to write in there, but all, in their journals just to write, but to also talk about what they're feeling when they're good, when they're bad. It's like getting that video of, Hey, make sure you, did you get that swing last night? Because man, I felt great. And I want to, I want to be able to see that one because whatever I was doing, that's the feel I'm hunting that whole same process can be on paper too. And so now they can look back and they got, okay, they, they faced Eric Johnson. They got to go back. Okay. Go back to the last time we saw him. And how did he go? How did he attack me? We as coaches all want to give them general information, but we also want to give them specific information. And if you know, they journal, you know, that you can go back to them and say, hey, what, did, what did your book say? What does your info say? And uh, uh, learn and grow from there. And how, maybe how have you changed as a hitter, you know, how have you changed even over the course of the last year to this year, especially with the uh, high school and college guys and even pro guys for that matter, when the, you know, swing change or a mental change has happened for them, intent change has happened for them. Now I, I attack that guy way differently. The hot zones change, all that stuff. So 
Uh, we're a big journal. I'm a big journal guy. I think it's important. The self-evaluation piece is, is, uh, is huge. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Um, for those of you listening, um, you can go to the ABCA Coaching Resource Library uh, on our website or within the My ABCA app, um, and you'll find a hitter um, post-game analysis journal sheet. It's already created for you. We made it. All you have to do is print it out and hole punch it for the kids and shove it in a binder. Um, in addition to that, I know we had mentioned uh, questionnaires a couple times as well. Um, basically having your, your guys self-evaluate themselves. I know RP had mentioned it, and I believe Link had mentioned it as well. But um, we also have a questionnaire in our coaching resource library uh, section of the website where you can just click on it, print it, hand it to your kids. They fill it out and give it back to you. Um, so some of these resources, I know there there are journal companies out there and uh, like the Always Grind stuff is awesome, uh, but it, you don't have to go spend money um, I'm sure you can just use the printer at your school or find somebody to print something for you fairly inexpensively. So, so yeah, we got you covered there. Uh, Coach Garbs, what do you, uh, what do you got? Final thoughts on approach, anything you, you just want to share? Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that I've learned a lot from uh, our student athletes, our assistant coaches is that we're in a, an era or a generation where our players are coming up very mechanical or very swing oriented, whether it be hitting instructors, pitching instructors, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all of these things, they're always watching these things. And most of the things that are, that they watch are all mechanical or physical, uh, in, and if you listen to our podcast here or our chat session here, man, so, so much nuggets of information from all the coaches on creating these drills. But if you think about these drills are all how to, uh, teach approach. Well, approach way before this age was taught competing. You and I go out to the yard. I try and strike you out. You try and strike me out. That's how you work approach. That's how we work adjustment, mid pitch adjustment. Though all of these things that we did were a lot more part of our growing up structure than they are now. Now we're a lot more swing based. So I think it's very important as coaches that we adjust and put more approach focus in our day-to-day -day practices, uh, get to know our players. If we want to teach better approach, we've got to know our players better because we've got to be able to communicate in the same, um, like, like the story I mentioned earlier. I want to make sure I'm telling them about the same pitch that they're seeing, so I want to be on the same page communicating. Um, what are some ways to do that? Uh, we do a, a very simple uh, questionnaire at the beginning. We give a guy a note card every day uh, for three things you're going to work on. And now it gives me, our assistant coaches, each other uh, an opportunity or a platform to communicate about, man, you know what? We were trying to work that breaking ball, that hanging breaking ball. We're trying to hit the hanging breaking ball. Holy cow. I hit into 37 double plays today. I, you know what I mean? That's not what I want to do. I think I better put that on the card tomorrow. You know, yeah, either that or I'm going to go take some ground balls. Get my shortstop out there while I'm hitting. Maybe we can get him better at feeling the ground balls while I'm hitting. So um, I think getting to know your player and spending more time observing and communicating with our player so that we know them better and we can help them become better as opposed to looking at a swing going, you know what, dude, that guy's got to get his arm up. There's no way he's going to hit without getting his arm up. Well, let's pay attention to what's, what pitches he's hitting. What is he swinging at? You know, and can he make some of the adjustments in a lot of these drills that were mentioned tonight, which are wonderful for helping guys be more athletic and adjust more to hitting. So what an honor to be here with you guys. Guys, I've learned so much tonight. I really appreciate all your comments. And, and Jr. thank you for having me, man. What a oh, wonderful my, thing. My pleasure, Coach. My pleasure. Uh, Chris, what, uh, what about you? And what do you have to say to, uh, to everybody out there watching? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to reiterate some of the stuff these guys just said. I mean – you know, Darren, I mentioned it earlier, there's a big difference between, you know, a swinger, a good swinger and a good hitter. You know, that that's pretty much the first thing I tell every one of our guys when they get to campus is, you know, every freshman that walks into a college campus, they want the pill. They want someone to say, hey, fix me right now and let me go hit. And, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to convince those guys that, hey, listen, we're going to talk nothing but approach for the first you know, six weeks of our fall until we've seen you guys compete on our field. Like, I want you guys to go out and compete and learn our approach system 
and go out. And once we get through the fall and, and we're, you know, have seen you guys swing the bat, then we're going to break down the mechanical side of it. And, and obviously, you know, like Link said earlier, that we're not, you know, saying that the swing's not important by any means. It's very important as well. But, you know, the approach is such a massive part of it. And then how do you, you know, decide on which approach? You know, what, what are the different ways that you can pick the right approach? Um, obviously, at our level, Darren's level especially, probably has way more than what we have. Um, you know, but from scouting reports, video, watching video, you know, our catcher this year is going to be a pretty good draft pick in a couple weeks, or I guess it's a week from now, right? Um, you know, he took it upon himself to, to download, you know, one of the, you know, our video software. So he could watch it, the opposing pitchers and the opposing hitters because he was calling our game, you know, and he had, you know, a big reason why he was so successful at the plate is because he studied it, man. He studied those other pitchers. He watched them. Um, you know, he had a good idea of what was going to happen to him at the plate. Um, obviously, during the game, you know, what, what this guy's doing. There's so many times the reason why I don't like telling our guys what to, you know, which approach to use is because there's plenty of times where I said, hey, man, this guy never throws in. And <laughs> sure never. enough, the second yeah. you say it, <laughs> yeah. the next pitch is coming in. It, yeah. it's, it's like clockwork. It's going to happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, but – Throughout your own at bats, throughout a game, you have to pay attention to what that guy's trying to do to you. You know, watch other people's at bats. I, I mentioned it earlier. You know, as a coach, you really get out of the playing shoes and just start watching, and you learn so much more about the game, about what the other pitcher's trying to do by just <coughs> watching. Like a lot of times, as players, guys get done with their at bat and they want to go sit down and they forget about it until you know it's time to go out and play defense. And it's really important, like Darren said, about the journal, you know, watching, watching other people's at bats, constantly watching what that guy is going to do, you know, helps you for the next at bat, helps you for the next pitch. All that stuff is really huge. And then communication, we preach it on our program a lot is, you know, communicate to each other. If you get, you know, it's a first about the game, that guy needs to come in and talk to the rest of the guys and so on and so forth. And hopefully by, you know, the, as early as possible, whether it's the first inning, third inning, fifth inning, then you can start to develop a way to attack this guy so where he can't, you know, continue to be in that game. Again, guys, I really appreciate being here. Jim, thanks so much for the invite. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it and uh, learned a ton from all of you guys tonight. Thanks so much. And uh, hopefully we can all get back out there on the field sometime soon. No doubt. No doubt. Link. Back over to you, bud. What, uh, what, what do you yeah. got for us? Well, I was consumed with the swing when I was a young coach. I, I thought I knew what it looked like. Um, I thought I could help the players, and I recognized that it was important. When I was first put into a situation where, um, as a coach, like you, you have to win games. I mean, that's ultimately where we are in this industry as you progress. Like, you you have to have more runs than the other team at the end of these games. Like, that's really the success of your job on that field revolves around are you winning games? And what I found myself doing, I, I coached third base, and I would try to grab the hitters. And on my one slide, I've got hitters, hitter, I, exclamation. I would try to, in between innings, round them up and what I realized, there were about six or seven things I was trying to tell the team in the sixth inning of these games. And my lack of working on it all fall and all preseason, it revolved around approach. I wasn't rallying my team together to try to tell everybody, you guys are all wrapping the bat. What are we doing? Like, it was that. This guy's throwing all the left-handed hitters first pitch fastballs away, and all the righties are getting first pitch fastballs in. Have you guys not figured that out? Like, lefties, why don't you just, like, sell out over there and righties? He's just throwing the ball to his glove side. And as I've reflected on those huddles, that's where the light switch went off for me, and it's been a long time, but that's where the approach – piece came in because if you don't find ways for your hitters to succeed and help you win, you know, you're ultimately not going to find a home as a college coach. Um, and I started to then obviously swing. Yes. 
But these things I kept trying to tell the guys in the middle of the games, why am I not working on it? Why am I not explaining it in September, October, November, January? Why, why am I not? That's where I realized I, I wasn't doing a good job. So I guess as a, as a coach watching this, if you feel like there's things that your team or individual hitters are not doing well in competition, how do you then transfer that into your practice setting so that you are giving them the weapons and, and the tactics they need when the swing is right to try to find a way to break down a good competitive arm. So that's, that's where this was born for me. And again, JR, thank you for, for inviting me on this and, and to all the ABCA, Craig and, and Dave, when, when he was running the ABCA, like it, the organization has brought me so far. And, and I just, I thank the organization and all the guys on the panel tonight. It's really outstanding stuff. Well, hey, thank you, man. Hey, I, uh, I've said it a million times before. Uh, the ABCA is a byproduct of our, of our coaches. We have a bunch of very special coaches out there. And uh, when you put special people together, things look awesome. And um, so, so thank you. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a byproduct of, of you guys. So, yeah. RP, any uh, closing thoughts? Let's see here. Do we lose? Ooh. You're muted. There we go. Oh, that works better. Well, he told me 2,000 people were on this call. I got all nervous. I forgot to turn the microphone back on. My so, bad. No, uh, no, I was going to say, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge is understanding uh, how much is too much to give these guys. I, I think that we, I know that I, I get in trouble because sometimes I want to help them so bad that I, that I give them too much. And before I know it, they're spinning and they're just, you know, they're spiraling out of control. So I think that as hitting coaches, sometimes the best thing you can do is just offer them an opportunity to, Hey man, let's go in the cage. And what I want you to do is I want you to just hit, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. And I want you to just kind of, you know, work through your problems instead of just constant feedback. I think sometimes that's what guys need the most. Um, because it's our job basically to help them overcome their obstacles uh, every hitter has obstacles. Every hitter's obstacles are going to be different. So it's important that we individualize plans for them as far as what they need to work on. Uh, but, you know, I hear a lot about the obstacles. Oh, that guy's stubborn. He doesn't buy in. It's, you know, that to me is my problem as a hitting coach to overcome. I have to overcome a player who doesn't understand what I'm trying to tell them and either come at it from a different angle or, uh, you know, explain it differently or get one of his teammates to help me explain it to him. But when I hear that stuff, I feel like that's, that's a me problem. That's not, that's not his stubbornness. Great baseball players oftentimes are stubborn and we've all done it long enough and been around enough guys to know that, that stubbornness is kind of a good trait uh, in this game. So our job is to really educate them and, and get through to them. Um, so yeah, individualize that stuff for those guys. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is try to provide and never get away from, which I think, um, I can't remember who mentioned it. I'm sorry, but, uh, it was mentioned that the kids now are coming into our programs and they're so swing oriented and they're so, Hey, what does my blast look like? What does the track man data look like that they end up, um, worrying so much more about that stuff. So get these guys to compete have them compete on a daily basis, find a way to end your sessions with, you know, we're going to compete, use the data. If you want, I use my rap Soto sometimes and we'll just say, Hey, we're going to have a round where it's between five degrees and 18 degrees. And you get a point if you hit it between five and eight and we just rotate them through and we go 10 minutes so you can get the most points, but just kind of implementing that competition on a daily basis. And then Jim, if you want to throw that slide up, I'll just explain it real quick. Cause I, I think, you know, I, I didn't bring it up during the conversation, but is it up right now? It is up and ready to go. Yep. Yeah. I think this was a great chart that I showed our guys. And essentially we get these, you know, the launch angle and the exit velo and, and it's, it gets thrown out to us left and right. And this, what for me, what this chart represents is we all diff, deal with different, um, especially at the college game. Not every single one of our guys is, has the tools to be a big leaguer. Um, so when we look at the exit velos, and I have that green line right through the middle. 
And that pretty much 96 to 97 is kind of that tipping point where it becomes, there's a lot more hits the higher you go on the exit in the launch angle. So uh, on the left is our, is our launch angle. And there's a really solid little area right through the middle where if you're kind of staying in that eight to 18 range, a lot of hits in that range. And I, I see all these guys talk about wanting to get the ball in the air and, and, you know, lift. And we all want homers, man. I can tell you, I hope we hit a lot of homers next year, but um, the reality is to be a good hitter, uh, you have to focus on staying on line. And I, I think that that's something that it's a concept. I think that um, younger hitters aren't getting the true picture of it because until you start getting into that higher exit velos, there's not a lot of hits at that 20 plus launch angle. Uh, and this was data taken straight out of the big leagues. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're hitting line drives, you don't have to hit it a hundred off the tee. It's great. I get, I, I get 20 emails a day about kids hitting 94 off the tee. And, uh, the, my point is, is if you can hit line drives in a game, you can play at the college level. Um, if you can do it really consistently and if you're hitting balls in the air and you don't have a lot of pop, you're going to get out a lot. So, but Jim, Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I had a blast and I hope, uh, Everybody enjoyed it. No doubt. Thank you, RP. We appreciate it for sure, man. Way to close it down. All right, folks. Well, that's all the time we have this evening. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our panelists, our production team, Pack Network, and our sponsor, Pocket Radar. These are guys that made this happen. If you missed something or clicked into the conversation a little bit late, this episode will be available on demand within the Coaching Resource Library section of our website and our My ABCA mobile application within about 24 hours. Make sure to tune in next week as we will discuss the current landscape of junior college baseball in our country. Um, and this is definitely a time where coaches need to hear about different options. The condensed Major League Baseball draft, um, an extra class added on to already swelled NCAA rosters. Um, I would take it upon yourself as a coach within the greatest game in this world to educate yourself about all levels of the game because there's going to be some of your kids where this is going to be an option for them and it's going to be a great option. Definitely an episode you do not want to miss. On behalf of everyone here at the ABCA, our board of directors, our executive committee, Craig Kylitz, John Litchfield, Juan Clark, Zach Hale, Matt West, Sarah Barlock, Brian Brownlee, and Mike Odom, thank you and stay safe out there. Tonight's episode of ABCA At Home Perspectives is made possible by Pocket Radar. Pocket Radar's smart coach app system with its unique ability to automatically capture videos with embedded velocities allows coaches to stay connected and work remotely with current players and new recruits. Their Bring Your Training Home initiative will provide education and resources, including webinars and a limited time discount to help players remotely train, develop, and be seen at home with video analysis tools. Check out their 2020 Expo Theater presentation located in the ABCA Video Library.